Operating a review website and a YouTube channel is pretty taxing on your life. I've been doing it for over 14 years and I'm at the point in my mid thirties where I typically spend about 16 hours a day in the office, six days a week. So any opportunity where I can try and make my life easier through the tech that we have in our hands helps us immensely. Which is why today with the help of QNAP and Sabrent, we're gonna be setting up a 16 terabyte Steam library that we can use for all of our game benchmarking. But before I get into that, here's a quick word from this video sponsor. Hello oh, mate, you all right? Yeah, just got all the bits from my banging new gaming PC. Just got to put it together. It's going to be so much better than yours. Oh, right. What did you get then? The latest Intel 12th gen processor, a feature packed motherboard and 32 gig of DDR4 memory. See, miles ahead of yours. <laughs> you, you realize that board needs DDR5 memory, don't you? Don't tell me you went and bought the wrong stuff. DDR4 is so 2014. I can't believe you was that stupid. <gasps> what? No, you're joking. What should I get then? For me, I'd be looking at Corsair's newest Vengeance DDR5 kits. Or if you're wanting that all important RGB, then go for the Dominator Platinum RGB. Oh, you are a lifesaver. Thanks. But where can I find out more? By clicking the link in the description below, of course. <laughs> you call me the stupid one. Okay, so let me give you some backstory. We test a lot of games. In fact, some of our latest pieces of content had me testing different CPUs and GPUs in 42 different games and at three resolutions. And between loading screens, changing launchers occasionally, and sitting there waiting for shaders to optimize within game, there's only so much you can do to optimize how quickly you can benchmark something. While some games do see us using the built-in benchmark tools, for the most part, probably around 95% of the games require some kind of human input. Now, the other side of things comes down to how many things we can actually benchmark at one time. I'm not a mythical creature with eight arms, so I find myself sitting at one test bench typically at a time. And with the weights between games, loading screens, and all that other stuff, I don't know, I kind of felt like I could be doing more, which is where I got my thinking cap on. With a little shuffle in our office and positioning multiple PCs next to me, I could move from benchmarking one system directly to the other, simply by just turning my chair. But there was a little bit of a drawback. While one application or game is loading, I could be booting up another and trying to maximize that time and then increasing my workflow. Now, of course, that has some limitations because with the likes of Steam, you can only run one game at a time due to DRM and the, just the way that it works, regardless of the system, without a few, let's say, workarounds. So I set up another Steam account and using the money that we get from our Patreon supporters, link down below, shameless plug, I started to buy second copies of every single game that we own so that we could then benchmark two things concurrently. But that's where the biggest snag of all comes in, space. You know, some games these days are just still relatively conservative in terms of file size, while others, and I think you know exactly where I'm going with this one, Call of Duty, Modern Warfare 2 is over 80 gig, Starfield is over 116 gig, and Baldur's Gate 3 comes in at over 120 gig. So because of all of that, space becomes a bit of an issue, and having large drives in each and every test bench just isn't feasible because not only would we need to get a company to send us multiple large and fast NVMe drives, we'd also then be plagued with issues for save games that are stored locally. And probably the worst thing of all, updates, which, I don't know, seem to be happening on almost a daily basis. We don't wanna be updating multiple systems at the same time because we still have a, a what I'd class as a relatively okay speed internet here, but nothing in terms of you know, gigabit speeds. So to combat this, we resorted to using external NVMe enclosures and two two terabyte Gen 4 NVMe SSDs, where half of the game sat on one drive and the other half on the other. We could then take the drive from one machine to the next with ease. Though sometimes this had issues with certain launchers where we had to reinstall the game because it had trouble finding the files. And yes, I'm looking at you, Epic. Steam, however, is, I guess relatively easy with the ability to add a secondary library. And Ubisoft Connect allows you to just locate the files for each individual game. And with most of the games we test on Steam, this is kind of where our true focus actually is. So the next step to making our lives easier was to consolidate everything from two two terabyte drives to a single four terabyte drive, which is where Sabrent came in and helped us out with a Rocket 4 Plus drive. It had the capacity and the speed, but we still had I guess limitations with using one system at a time. And again, that had to change. 
which is what brings me on to today. So apologies for, let's say, quite a long intro. I'd heard from friends of mine in the industry about running a Steam library across a network, so I wanted to give it a go for myself. So with that in mind, I knew that we had to remove any form of limitation, whether that be storage or processing power or network speeds, which is where, as I mentioned, QNAP and Sabrent came to the rescue. For now, we knew that we could fit all of our games onto about four terabytes of storage, but knowing the ever-growing demand for games and thinking about the future, Sabrin sent us two of their Rocket 4 Plus 8 terabyte Gen 4 NVMe drives that we could put into a RAID 0 array for 16 terabytes of storage space, with speed at the heart of it. Redundancy wasn't really anything we needed to worry about, as the NAS we're using has eight hard drive bays that, through QNAP's own software, we could actually set up some form of automation to back up from the NVMe drives to some slower hard drive storage in its own separate pool on, say, a weekly basis. And even then, if something happened to the NVMe drives, we could just re-download the games. So it's not like our video files that sit on another NAS with redundancy, where keeping the backups is vitally important. For this type of scenario, yeah, speed was really the key factor. So moving over to the NAS, QNAP came through with the TVS H874 8-bay NAS. At the very center of it, it is complete overkill for what we need with an i5-12400 6-core 12-thread processor and 32 gig of DDR4 memory. But the reason we went with this particular model comes down to the expandability, that a 10 GBE network card could be added in so we don't lose any performance across the network. And the fact that while this NAS has two slots for NVMe drives, it's not just like for other sort of NAS based systems out there where it's used for SSD caching. So you can you know, grab files quicker than getting them off of hard drives. But with this, we can actually use it so we can utilize them in their very own separate pool. And that again was a key factor. So with all that in mind, we got built in with the two separate drives, put the 10 GB expansion card in, which I admit was a bit daunting at first as you actually have to remove the 250 watt power supply to be able to install it. Though once we'd figured that out, it was relatively easy. And then we got creating our pool through QNAP's own software interface. Now our first thought was to set the pool up as an iSCSI drive so that Windows would just see it as a drive and not a network drive. But then we found it has actually got its own limitations of only being able to have it accessed by a single system at a time. And I guess that just, well, defeats the object of what we're actually trying to do. So instead we settled for a single network drive by using Samba or SMB, which not only means that we'll be able to access all of the data we need from multiple machines, but keeping throughput across the network at its maximum. Because I guess what I'm trying to say is if the drives are too slow, then our performance will suffer. If the network is too slow, the performance will suffer. And when you're testing game performance of a CPU or a GPU, there is no room for intolerance or bottlenecks. The performance needs to be at the same level as if the games were installed locally inside each individual machine, even if multiple machines are accessing the data at the same time. Though obviously talking about separate titles, as we couldn't run, say, Call of Duty on two Steam accounts, accessing the same data at the same time. So that's the, I guess, only limitation we should have. Now, going back to the networking side of things, our office was kitted out with Cat5e cables, which is perfect under the relatively small lengths of runs we have at gigabit speeds, but gigabit isn't fast enough for what we're trying to achieve. And we actually tested that and found in games it just didn't even really load textures properly. So yeah, gigabit isn't fast enough. So after purchasing a drum of Cat6A cable, which is good for 10 GBE and in the lengths that we need, we needed a switch to give us more ports as the QNAP QXG 10G2T card, which we actually put in the NAS, only has two ports as it is a dual port card. So again, QNAP to the rescue as they now manufacture a lot of networking equipment and the QSW M12088C managed switch came in. It's a 12 port managed switch with four 10 GBE SFP plus ports and eight SFP plus slash RJ45 combo ports. And while we're only using RJ45 connectors for now, SFP, I don't know, it may be something that we'll change over to at a later date if we wanna potentially go even faster. So you're probably starting to see a theme around not only getting something that is functional, but something that will future-proof us as well. Now, as I mentioned, games are getting larger. Technology is becoming more demanding. So having something that's overkill for what we need is actually really important. 
It also means that if we wanted to, and this is something I do want to do in the very near future, we may look at setting up a render server. So the switch could actually come in very, very handy for that too. Now the kit we're using today really ticks all of the right boxes at every step of the way. So with the drives installed, the network card installed, and the stupidly thick Cat6A cable just sprawled out across the office, we were ready to see what could be done. But first, well, there was something else to do. We needed a baseline. When testing, we needed to figure out if we were losing performance across the different scenarios that we threw at the systems. We were happy with small differences in performance if it fell within a margin of error of just a few percent. But if we saw large performance differences, either with performance too high or too low, we needed to figure out why that was happening and continue to retest the systems until we managed to get all of the issues ironed out. For the test, we ran four games at three resolutions under four different scenarios. Each of these was meant to isolate any potential issues we could find with running our games over the network. The first two tests were pretty simple. We ran the games off the system locally and off of an external drive like we did before. The third test was the first system running a game over the network off of the NAS, and the final test was running the game over the network whilst another system was also running a game off of the NAS concurrently. So to start with testing, we ran Cyberpunk 2077 and at 1080p we saw margin of error differences of only 3 FPS at the most between scenarios, which works out to only be a 3% difference, with nothing in particular standing out as the best option. Moving up to 1440p, we see performance drop as you would expect, but otherwise we see no difference. Again, the biggest differences that we see in FPS was just three frames, placing it neatly into the margin of error category. But with smaller numbers, the difference in percentage does now increase to 4%. But with such a small variance in FPS, it's really nothing to worry about, and retesting saw all of the results change, whether it be up or down by a few FPS. At 4K we see more of the same story with a maximum FPS difference of just 3 frames difference, which in this case works out to 5%, but again 3 FPS is margin of error and isn't anything we're concerned about. What we do see here though is that System 2's performance sits much closer together, with only a 1 FPS difference between results, with only the local drive deviating from the otherwise identical performance across the board. Next up was Doom Eternal which we picked because of the high frame rates that this game is easily able to push on even lower tier hardware. And at 1080p we see the performance still sitting right alongside each other with the biggest differences we see being across both systems when running across the NAS concurrently, where we see a 10 FPS drop when compared to running just one system and running locally. But with such high frame rates this is still something I would consider a margin of error since it only works out to be a 2% difference. At 1440p, performance narrows yet again with even tighter frame rates across the board, with nothing that stands out as wildly different. Then at 4K, I'm starting to sound like a broken record since everything is pretty much the same yet again, with at most a 5 FPS difference between results on both systems. But with the two systems getting very different average frame rates per second, the percentage differences between the highest and lowest scores sit noticeably apart, with System 1's results sitting 1% apart and System 2's sitting about 3% apart. Our next game was Hogwarts Legacy where we did see some pretty large performance gaps with up to a 5% difference in the FPS. But through retest after retest on both of these systems and on other systems just to confirm results, we found that Hogwarts Legacy is a bit temperamental and does deviate quite a bit between runs even if they were run back to back without changing anything. So again this can count as margin of error. At 1440p we saw the performance was much more in line as the GPU started to take a bit more of the workload, with a maximum of only a 2 FPS difference between the highest and lowest results. With the exception of System 2's local drive, which seems to be a bit of an outlier as the 1% low FPS also sticks out, but only sitting 4 and 3 FPS behind the next lowest score respectively, so it doesn't really seem that bad and is again margin of error. Moving over to 4K, we see, surprise surprise, that same thing. Very minor changes between the results, with the biggest difference seen being only 2 FPS, which works out to be a 4% difference at these lower frame rates, but it still falls into the phrase of the day, margin of error. Our final game is Shadow of the Tomb Raider, which is known for being very CPU intensive, hence why even years later we still use it to test. And for our purposes today, it fits the bill perfectly, as it allows us to isolate the CPU over the GPU when looking at how the NAS affects performance of the games. And at 1080p, we see everything is pretty much identical, with margin of error differences of 1 FPS across the board. Nothing in particular stands out here and in fact just helps to emphasise how between all of these storage methods and scenarios, we are always making the most out of what we have. Moving over to 1440p we see the same thing once again with margin of error single frame differences between all of the results, but with the 1% low performance on system 1 sitting just a little bit further apart, with a 4 FPS difference between the highest and lowest score. 
Finally, at 4K, we see more of the same with pretty much no differences between all of the results. So after all the testing and days configuring, it seems like we are getting exactly what we were hoping for. And our performance sees no decrease going from one scenario to another. So I think it's safe to say that it was a big success. Everything worked flawlessly and pretty much straight out of the box. Now, when it came in, the 10 GB managed switch, well, we logged in for a brief second and then just logged back out. We didn't need to access it again. And that was really just out of curiosity more than anything. But as I said, it worked straight out of the box. And the fact that it flashes orange if working or green if working at 10 GBE speeds, is just a nice little touch. The NAS, as mentioned, well, is complete overkill. And I'm fine with that because while it's used for what we need right now, it does give us scope for developing it into something else in the future. Because even running multiple systems from the game library, the i5 and the 32 gig of RAM didn't even see us scratching the surface in terms of the potential of what they can handle. But because we needed an as that could handle two NVMe drives as a storage pool and not just cache, and obviously have 10 GBE, this one just fitted the bill. So summing up, is this complete overkill? Yeah. yeah. Will the average user get anything out of it? Probably not. But was it fun to do? Definitely. And for us, it will actually help us immensely that we can firstly be more organized with our game data, but secondly, it allows us to produce more content and much quicker by having one central location for absolutely everything. When we do a random live stream, which as a side note, we are looking to do some live stream builds soon. So let me know if that's something you wanna see. Then we can build a PC, put a 10 G NIC inside if the motherboard doesn't have it, load the game and not have to wait to download games or to grab a drive. It just makes everything effortless. So there we have it. Bit of a long one, but well worth making, I think. And like I said, I know 99% of people aren't going to do something like this, but hopefully you can see why we did. And hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, a like and a sub to the channel would be amazing. And if you love what we do, then consider supporting us through the super special Patreon Members Club. You'll not only help support us, but also get access to a whole ton of goodies, including access to our chart data, bi-weekly game nights, discounts at our merch store, and a secret area on our Discord. The link for that is, as always, down below. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you in the next one. See you later, guys. Bye-bye.